Hey, what's up, guys? America. Welcome to Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln Fun, Fun Facts. Facts. My name is Huey. And I'm Bear. And we will be sharing with you 10 facts about Abraham Lincoln. Fun facts. So have fun. All right, here we go. Number one. We got Abraham Lincoln, born February 12th, 1809. That's a long time ago. Well, go see Hawk. Number two. Abraham Lincoln died by assassination in 1865. 1865. Also a very long time ago. Very long. Uh, well, as a young child, at age 9, his mom died of milk poisoning. Kind of sad. Ooh. Number 4. Later in life, he got married to a woman by the name of Mary. How sweet. Very sweet. And number five, he had four children, Robert, Edward, Willie, and Tad. Only Robert survived to manhood. Yay, Robert! Number six, as president, he should have won this award, but it wasn't an award. He was the first president to have a beard. Number seven, he was also the tallest president at six foot four. Much taller than I am. Somewhere up there. Be really good at basketball. Probably. Number eight. Abraham Lincoln hated killing animals. Number nine. The hating killing animals, he owned animals. So he owned a dog, some horses, some cats, and a turkey too. I wonder what Thanksgiving would have been like. Last but not least, we got number ten. Number ten. A week before he died, was assassinated at Ford's Theater. He had a dream that he walked down the stairs and looked into a coffin and saw his face. And when asking who and why, he was told that, of course, yes, it was him because he saw his face. And why? Because he was shot by an assassin. My why? Blood. Alright, thank you. Me. Thank you, everybody. This has been Abraham, Abraham Lincoln Fun Fact. Have a wonderful day. I hope this was tons of fun. Abraham Lincoln was hatched into this world on February 12, 1809, in Hodgenville, Kentucky. He was born in the famous one room log cabin at Sinking Spring Farm. His father, Thomas, was one of the richest men in the country and very influential in Abe's life. Thomas Lincoln worked for the government, sitting on juries and working as a prison guard. His role in politics increased Abe's liking for political work. By 1816, his father lost all his land in court cases, but he was still a highly respected community and church member for his honesty. This would later rub off onto his son, who many have come to nickname Honest Abe. Although Lincoln seldom mentioned his mother, Nancy Hanks, he did say once that he owed everything to her guidance. Shortly after her death, Abe's father married Sarah Johnston who encouraged Abe to grow in his education and was a positive moral aid. At a young age, and even throughout his life, Abraham Lincoln would read as often as he could. Some neighbors recalled that he used to walk for miles to get a book to read. This not only showed perseverance and dedication, but proved his desire to stretch his mind to learn about the world and country he lived in. With the lessons in honesty, kindness, gratitude, and modesty that he learned from his parents, Abraham Lincoln would move on to become as influential of a man as his father was to him and change the country. But first, he would leave home to become a shopkeeper in New Salem. While in New Salem, Lincoln started to make a name for him and became very popular with the townsfolk. Working with the public, Lincoln acquired social skills and developed a very good storytelling talent. It was there that over time he was appointed as postmaster of New Salem by President Andrew Jackson and eventually a general store owner. As postmaster, he would walk for miles to deliver a letter that he knew was of importance, which showed how much of a helpful character he was even before becoming president. Being the friendly person he was, Lincoln was able to gain the popularity to be elected for the state legislator in 1834, but he had obstacles along the way that better prepared him for the success when the country needed him most. In 1832, he decided to try out for politics, but lost in the election and instead participated in the Black Hawk War, which began due to Native Americans hoping to resettle tribal lands. Therefore, when war erupted in Illinois, Lincoln joined the fight to support his state. 
The volunteers in his regiment elected Lincoln to be the captain, and it was there that he was first introduced to the world of politics by making several important political connections. After the war ended, Lincoln was able to pursue his political ambitions to join the Illinois state legislature as a Whig. Being part of the Whig party, Abraham Lincoln formulated his opposition to slavery just as his father had opposed it before him. Lincoln served the Illinois state legislature for four terms and resigned in 1841. In 1846, Lincoln won a seat in the House of Representatives for a two-year term. He was the only Whig. He opposed the Mexican-American War that President Polk had brought upon them, and Lincoln said that the war was only for military glory, that attractive rainbow that rises in showers of blood. Lincoln's verbal disapproval of Polk's military strategy caused Lincoln to lose popularity. After his single house term ended, he was given the opportunity to be governor of the Oregon Territory, but if he accepted, his political and legal career would have ended in Illinois and so he remained to practice law. Although no longer part of the Illinois state legislature, Lincoln still desired to be part of politics. His skills that he had learned as a leader in the Black Hawk War and his ability to tell stories made Lincoln that likable man that we learn about today. Learning from his political experiences and fair developing his Whig point of view from the 1830s to the 1850s, this part of his life would serve him well for making decisions in the coming future. At this time, around the 1840s and 1850s, America was growing geographically and demographically. First of all, there was the invention of the railway in 1812, which quickly spread in popularity as more and more businesses wanted to utilize interstate commerce. By the 1840s, the ratio of northern railroads to southern railroads was greatly outweighed. The north, being a mostly industrial society, desired and needed many more miles of track than did their agricultural neighbors in the south, who, in respect to the north, had very little. There was considerable concern about the cultural changes introduced with the railway network. The greatest change it brought was that it began to split the two sides, something that would gain momentum as the years progressed into the 1960s. Because of the mass railway system in the north, northerners saw great prosperity and increased organization than their soon-to-be opponents in the south. Aside from the magnanimous invention of the railway in the early 1800s, demographically, the country experienced vast change and differences. The topic being referred to is obviously that of slavery. Slavery had existed in America since the early 1700s, but the growing distinction between slavery that existed in the North and that which was quickly growing in the South was becoming more evident in the mid-1800s, 150 years later. What did this mean for presidents like Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, and Johnson? This meant that not only would these presidential candidates have to choose sides, pro or anti-slavery, they would have to go on and pass legislation for or against their views, all the while paying attention to who their enemies were in the country. Unfortunately for Lincoln, two of the presidents before him, Polk and Buchanan, were pro-slavery and passed legislation such as the Fugitive Slave Act within the Compromise of 1850 towards their position. According to the U.S. Census of 1850, the population was 23,191,867, up from 13 million in 1830. The 1840s and 1850s were decades of growth and mass immigration. Just as with the railways, the ratio of north to south population was 23 million to 8 million. Southerners looked in distaste towards developments in the north, primarily looking at the differences in religion. They disliked the loudness of the Puritans' proclamation and anti-slavery declarations. Abraham Lincoln, although not a church attendee, was quoted saying, quote, In regards to this great book, the Bible, I have but to say it is the best gift God has given to man. All the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book but for it we could not know right from wrong. All things most desirable for man's welfare, here and hereafter, are found portrayed in it." Unquote. Wow, wasn't that a great statement? From this quote, one can infer that the North disliked slavery for mostly religious purposes, whereas the South held the view that slavery was a necessary evil, used for the purpose of agricultural aid. In 1847, moving back into the political way of life, Abraham Lincoln decided to join others in describing the war of Mexico as wicked and an attempt to extend slavery. In Illinois, the pro-war Democrat newspapers called him a Latter-day Benedict Arnold and denounced his views as a slur against the volunteers of Illinois serving in the military. Lincoln didn't run for re-election and instead returned to the practice of law. The most influential political action that Lincoln was part of before his presidency was the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858. 
this series of seven debates, mainly focusing on the topic of slavery, took place across Illinois over 70 days, which brought national attention to Lincoln. With his nine-inch stovepipe hat on, Lincoln stood above seven feet tall, while Stephen Douglas was short and stout as five foot four inches. Douglas was a well-known Democratic politician who was pro-slavery. Douglas had great influence in the Compromise of 1850 and with the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. His forceful speech and small stature gained him the nickname Little Giant. Then again, Lincoln also gave powerful speeches such as his House Divided speech in 1858. I believe this government cannot endure permanently, half slave and half free. I expressed this belief a year ago, and subsequent developments have but confirmed to me. I do not expect the Union to dissolve. I do not expect the House to fall. But I expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and put its course of ultimate extinction or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old and new alike. Thank you very much. While Douglas was a Democratic nominee, Lincoln had been nominated as the Republican candidate for the debates that would decide who would win the Illinois Senate seat in 1858. The debates were held in seven towns across Illinois. Ottawa on August 21st, Freeport on August 27th, Janesboro on September 15th, Charleston on September 18th, Galesburg on October 7th, Quincy on October 13th, and Alton on October 15th. The debates that took place in Freeport, Quincy, and Alton all drew the largest crowds from neighboring states because the topic of slavery was crucial for many states across the nation. Newspaper coverage was intense. Newspapers came all the way from Chicago to cover the debates and spread the news around the country. Many newspaper companies edited a particular candidate speech depending on who they supported. After Lincoln lost the debates, he went on to edit all the speeches, both his and Douglas's, in the debates and have them published in a book. The widespread coverage of the debates and the subsequent popularity of the book was one of the factors that eventually led to Lincoln's nomination for the President of the United States by the 1860 Republican National Convention in Chicago. This monumental stepping stone of debating against Stephen Douglas was crucial for Lincoln's election because it brought him out of the shadows and into the light where everyone now knew him and his potential to be a leader. Then came the great election year of 1860. This would become one of the greatest years in the history of the country and the largest turning point in slavery's history. Before I delve into the highs and lows of his election, it would only be wise to address how he got to the point he found himself, because just a decade earlier he was turning his head away from government work and searching for a new path. Luckily for slavery and for our country as a whole, specifically the Union, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 turned his head back towards the field of politics. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 may have been the single most significant event leading to the Civil War. By the early 1850s, settlers and entrepreneurs wanted to move into the area now known as Nebraska. However, until the area was organized as a territory, settlers were not, would not move there because they could not legally hold a claim on the land. The southern states' representatives in Congress were in no hurry to permit a Nebraska territory because the land lay north of the 3630 parallel, where slavery had been outlawed by the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Just when things between the north and south were, were in an uneasy balance, Kansas and Nebraska opened fresh wounds. It is time for the future 16th president to step into the fray. What better way could he do this than by running for the presidency in the 1860 election? Let me lay out the facts. Moving into the election, the country was divided over states' rights and slavery. The Democratic Party, due to the tensions between the Southern Democrats and the Northern Democrats of the April 1860 Assembly in Charleston, South Virginia, split. The main topic spoken about the Assembly was to endorse the idea of a federal slave code for the territories. This would secure the rights of slaveholders to enter the territories throughout the territorial period. Unfortunately, the majority of the delegates refused to accept the Southern position. In the North, civilians viewed slavery with economic backwardness, aristocracy, violence, illiteracy, intemperance, and immorality. Due to the strong tensions between the two geographical regions, the executive office became more involved. Without a doubt, Abraham Lincoln stepped in to save the day. 
At the 1860 election, the voting went as follows. Abraham Lincoln won 180 electoral votes and 1.8 million popular votes. Southern Democrat Stephen A. Douglas won 12 electoral votes and 1.3 million popular votes. And Northern Democrat John C. Breckinridge won 72 electoral votes and 847,000 popular votes. Lastly, John Bell of the Constitutional Union Party won 39 electoral votes and 592,000 popular votes. Thanks to the dispute between the Democrats, which split their party, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, Lincoln won the election despite stiff competition. We're on an interview hunt, and I see a Roosevelt student in his natural habitat. Oh, hello there, sir. We are here today with a Roosevelt student who has just watched the Lincoln movie. Is that right, sir? Yeah. Yeah. How did you like it there, sir? It was so good. It was amazing. I have so much more respect for Lincoln now. I realize, you know, how all the challenges he's gone through. In a sense, I'd actually say it's one of my heroes. That's really interesting, sir. So what really did give him the ability to be such a successful politician in the political sphere? I mean, despite being the underdog and facing all the odds, that would make even Chuck Norris tremble. <laughs> I totally agree with you. It all begins with his family, actually. His hmm. dad and mom and stepmom were very influential in his life, teaching him the life lessons he needed to succeed as a leader of the United States. Then he went on to be a businessman, and a good one at that. <laughs> all those years in the shop taught him about leadership and how to talk with people. Oh, and don't forget, this is also where he started getting himself involved in politics. <laughs> and thank goodness for that. So, real quick, quick <laughs> how, how much do I resemble Abraham Lincoln? Yeah, <laughs> but I, he, he's not really tall enough, and the beard isn't really scruffy enough, and the ears aren't really pointy enough, they're not big enough. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I hear you there. So, uh, getting on with stuff, uh, <laughs> let's give a talking to your hero, Abraham Lincoln. Ow. Yeah, being that Lincoln was so tall, he could stand above the crowd when he gave his speeches. His House Divided speech that he gave when appointed to run as the Republican candidate for the Illinois Senate was one of his most influential speeches. I hear that. His failing allowed him to run for president, so I'm glad he failed, right? Yeah. Then when the Democratic Party split, he won presidency, and the whole idea of slavery and secession and the Civil War came and went, and now look where we are today, freedom and equality. That's some great words of wisdom. So, remind me again, what's your name? Oh yeah, it's, it's kind of an ironic name for this interview, actually. It's uh, Stephen with a V, Douglas and two S's. My parents are Canadian and didn't realize the problem with it. I go by Stevie Dougie now. That's all, folks.